outside certain districts? Do we want to be able to have poorer people in these, in these historic districts? So, Ed, what do you? Sure, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to embrace the caricature. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so uh, my view starts with the position that New York is, a, is super Monday, right? It is a wonder of the world. And it is a miraculous place of economic uh, strength. This narrow range of Midtown is more productive than many of America's states. It is a place of cultural vigor. It has been enabling those collaborative chains of creativity that have been you know, at the heart of the human experience. It is about the social connections that actually are most important for humanity. Now, the problem is that it's too expensive to live here. Now, I'm an economist. I don't know any way to repeal the laws of supply and demand. If we are going to have a city that is wondrous, right, it's going to be expensive unless we allow building. And historic preservation is one of a series, and not even the most important one, but one of a large series of ways in which New York has made it extraordinarily difficult to build. We are never going to get to a New York that's affordable unless we allow the building that, that can provide that affordability. And I will stop from saying anything good about preservation, but we'll come back and I actually, there is actually much to be said for our beautiful older buildings, but I'm going to stick with the caricature. Okay, yeah. okay. I have nothing, this is going to be the most boring session that you're going to have in the whole day because uh, he, he, he's going to hate to be tagged like this. But Ed Glazer is preservation's biggest advocate because the <laughs> things that he says are the measures of success for cities is not only true, as he just said, for the city of New York, but even more true for the historic districts in New York. Uh, I don't, there has to be more building, there has to be more housing, there has to be more affordable housing, there has to be more skyscrapers. None of that, I, I disagree with at all. The issue is that, that this focus on 4% four, 4 of the developable land area in New York under the control of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. 95% of it, you can do whatever you damn well please. And so this idea that somehow this four this tiny, look at this two rows in front. Would you do me a favor and stand up just for a second? <laughs> so, and all the rest of you point at him. So that's about, that's about the share of, the, of New York that's in historic districts. And to say that he's responsible for the lack of affordability is like saying that the federal deficit is to blame for the amount that goes to veterans benefits, that the same share of the federal budget that historic districts are of the city of New York. So it's not that I don't have a complete agreement with all those needs, it's just that, that the, the caricaturing of historic districts as the villain is just silly. But let's, let's not forget, right, so there's a very different world in Manhattan and outside, right? right. 20% of the land in Manhattan, according to your report, uh, is, in a, is in a historic preservation district, and 27% of the lots are in, uh, are, are in historic preservation districts. And if we have a vision, which is we're gonna build towers for middle-income people, we're gonna put them all in the most distant parts of the city, that feels like, to me, the Parisian Banlieu solution. It feels like a solution that says we're not going to welcome middle and lower income people into the heart of the city, but we're gonna banish them out to the, to the outer, outer rings. And that feels profoundly disturbing to me. I mean, the, the heart of the city is the mixing of the two different right. groups. And certainly, again, from your own report, right, if you look within Manhattan, and I agree this is not true city-wise, but if you look within Manhattan, the share Hispanic in historic districts is one-third the share outside of historic districts in, in Manhattan. The share African-American is one-half in historic districts than, out, than outside. When I've compared areas before and after they became historic districts, they conspicuously became less diverse when they turned in historic and preservation much less affordable. districts. And much less affordable. Right. And I think this is the, the, you know, I love the village, right? It's a wonderful urban space. I had the, the great privilege to spend a month hanging out with Eric uh, and others at NYU last year, last year doing this, trying to civilize my suburban children uh, in, in the village. And it, it's absolutely magnificent. And Jane Jacobs was right when she talked about how this low rise, low rise stuff, stuff works wonders. But on the other hand, right, she was dead wrong when she talked about that as a model for affordability. Right? Because, in fact, you don't, you know, she looked at old buildings, noted that they were cheap, and new buildings, and noted that they were expensive, which led her to conclude that the way to promote affordability was to make sure that we kept all our buildings old and didn't provide any, any new buildings. Right? That's not how supply and demand works. If you don't allow building, if you restrict supply, prices go up in a high demand area. And it's not how diversity is maintained. And you don't have to look further than the village, right? where townhouses start at $8 million, and you have to either be a hedge fund manager or an NYU professor to actually afford, <laughs> afford living there. They give them um, out for free. The, uh, go, go get a job. <laughs> well, 
interesting premise. And I'm, I think that there is something um, uh, distorted about a neighborhood that's 85% white and that's 2% African American and 2.5% Latino and average household income is $200,000 and average housing value is a million dollars. I think, I think that, you know, I'm sorry, that's not a East Side. That's where Professor Glazer lives in Massachusetts, a place that's profoundly un. So I just think there's a little disingenuousness of saying, ooh, this somehow villainizing uh, uh, districts in, in the city of New York because there's a, there's a skew. Now, what is true, N no question that in Manhattan, there is a skew of white and rich in historic districts. Ooh, absolutely true. What's interesting is in the, in the outer boroughs with a partial exception of Brooklyn, in fact, it's the reverse. There's a higher share of both lower income, African American, Hispanic, in historic districts than there is of the range of a whole. Now, th this, this issue about where the additional density ought to go, well, it has to go all over, no question about that. I'm not saying, hey, we have to go to the first point of Queens to build 200 skyscrapers, but here's the reality. We do, here's where we're in agreement. We do need density. And the density in the historic districts in uh, Manhattan, if we want to just talk about Manhattan, are in fact as dense, as nearly as dense as the most dense neighborhoods in Hong Kong. Well, Hong right. Kong. one argument is why pick on historic districts, because they are, I, I, in, in, in a city like New York, it's a very, very dense place already. Um, one thing I want to ask you, Don, you know, you make the argument in your report that uh, historic buildings are now historic manufacturing sites, old manufacturing buildings or centers for beer gardens and tech and all this stuff. And at the same time, you think we need preservation laws because the market unchecked will misbehave. But in fact, that isn't a contradictory. The market is behaving admirably as you would want turning these old manufacturing centers into, you know, repurposing them. Yeah, in, 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 in two kind of circumstances. One, it does speak to the quality, the attractiveness, the character of those places that's being attracted. Second, many of those cases is because they were, the reason that happened is because they were protected. That is why it happened. We, again, the, the, as, as Professor Glazer knows, that trying to look at property values in the city of New York is just because it's such a weird system, it's tough at best. But other places where we've looked is this preservation premium, this, this extra amount that people pay for being in historic districts is about two thirds of the quality that's there and the other third for the sheer protection it provides. And nobody pays a premium to get the privilege of appearing before some goofy preservation commission. It's that the confidence that some lunatic across the street can't do something to the, uh, his building that has an adverse effect on the value of mine. And that it, all of the things that make cities great, that makes New York great, in fact, are true in, is more true in historic districts in the city of New York. Yeah, the, the logic, I mean, that's the logic of nimbyism everywhere, right? I mean, everyone wants the assurity and wants to make sure the change doesn't happen nearby. Right. And the result of that at a national level is that we've meant that it's, we've made it sort of impossible to build and impossible to change the most socially and economically vibrant parts of the country by essentially allowing, you know, nimbyists throughout the country to say no to, to everything. And again, I just do want to just retreat from the caricature for one second, right? It is absolutely true that there are buildings in this city that need to be protected. I have absolutely no doubt on that whatsoever. I am the son of an architectural historian, right? I believe, in fact, that many of our buildings are the most precious things that we have. But the right answer is not to straightjacket vast neighborhoods. Because often, some of the most precious spaces in, in cities are places where there's a dialogue between a great architect of the 21st century and a great architect of the 18th century or the 19th century. And having a, a system that sort of puts a straitjacket on everything, and there's no doubt that historic preservation districts have reduced the amount of supply of new, new building, right? So the question is not whether or not the density at a point in time is higher. The question is whether or not the new density added goes down. And certainly from my own work, we find quite substantial reductions in the delivery of, of new density. And, and it's just, I think, so important that we enable cities to continue change and continue growing. I mean, think about how many of the most beautiful buildings in New York would have been shut down if the preservationists of 1908 had been able to say, no tall buildings along Fifth Avenue. We like our rich people's mansions, no Rockefeller Center, no Empire State, right? A world, could have, could have of, you know, a world of villas, right, <laughs> right, right. And that's, that, you know, that's not a city that I would have liked. And, and uh, you know, I think we need some balance here. I think we need balance, too. 
And that's why 95% of the land in New York do all the whatever you, you want to do. But I do have to apologize both to Professor Glazer and to, to many of you in that we as preservationists have clearly not done a sufficient job of explaining how historic preservation has evolved over the last two decades. That when, when your father was the architectural historian and when the Landmarks Commission was established in, in, uh, in New York City, that historic preservation was about preserving the most monumental of buildings and the houses of rich dead white guys. That's what it was. But that and the architectural gems, that's what it was. That's not remotely what historic preservation is about today. Historic preservation today is about the, the evolution, the story, the nature, the character of the city. And so districts, most districts in the last 15 years that have been, that have been listed in the city of New York have not been about architectural grandeur at all. They have been about the tie to the African American history or the historic uh, or the Hispanic history or the, the gay and, and lesbian community. They're the stories. And I think there's more to the story of New York than mansions of dead, dead rich white guys. We, we just, New York just landmarked the Stonewall Inn, for example, which is, you know, our aesthetically incredibly insignificant building. Um, Ed, can you speak to that a little? I mean, how there's this whole movement to cult, for cultural preservation. I, I don't have I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. I think that's an appropriate landmark for for New York to have, 100. percent But it doesn't, you know, that's not a great swath of the city that we're right, shutting down. Right, it's, right, it's an right. important part of New York's history. We're going to cut to questions in one second. I just wanted to ask about this economic multiplier effect of, of, of historic preservation in terms of tourism. You say in your report that people come to cities and spend money to see buildings. We have no really way of, of, of calculating who comes to come to this conference and sure, might go see. That's, that's right. And, and the, my goal in life is to, to move past the point where if you say historic preservation, economic development in the same sentence, the automatic response is, oh, you must mean heritage tourism. Certainly has a big impact, has a big impact here. What's interesting about the tourism, and we talked about it because it is an element of the whole. The issue of the, the, the tourism industry acts as if there's some certainty to 14 decimal points about the number of tourists. In fact, it's all much more art than right. science. So it, all you can do is look at patterns. Nobody comes to New York City only to look at historic stuff. Right, although there are cities that are in, in, engaged in a renaissance like Buffalo, and there is a real campaign in Buffalo, a real marketing campaign to get people to come to Buffalo for its That's right, but the buildings. trouble in trying to, 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 on any kind of level of exactitude, say exactly right. the impact of that, is that nobody does one thing, and so you have to do some kind of generalized conclusions. And it's, it's big in New York. There's a huge percentage right. of the visitors here who do historic site stuff while they're here, but to try to say that's the only thing that Ed Glazer does when he comes here is just right. silly. Questions? In building, sorry, an increase in building in neighborhoods that don't have historic preservation, but we haven't necessarily seen a big increase in density because those buildings have been built as luxury super towers with gigantic apartments that people don't live in. So I don't know how you can speak about building in general in Manhattan without also talking about affordable housing when you're talking about increasing density. This is the 157 phenomenon, right? And I can't tell you how much I, I, I hate I hate what that building seems to symbolize in terms of, uh, you know, what density does not do. Um, so I think it's absolutely right that New York City's housing regulations have to be skewed more towards providing mid-sized units for middle-income people rather than focusing on these very large hyper-luxury towers. Now, it is true that if you have a regulatory process, if you have a permitting process that is incredibly difficult. It means that in some sense, over the years, the only thing they can get through is the projects with incredibly high margins, which means the units for billionaires. Um, but I think what needs to happen here is not just a rethinking of the preservation districts in Manhattan, although I think that's part of it, but a rethinking of the whole permitting process, and one that actually strongly favors middle-income, middle-sized sized units, because this city needs to be open. The city needs to change. The city needs to allow people to come in to welcome it as it has for hundreds of years. And that only happens with more space and more middle-sized units. I, I want to uh, add to Tina's point. Another phenomenon, of course, that we know of in Brooklyn is that single family, in, in these historic 
neighborhoods, single family, it's not just that no new development is being built, it's single family homes, uh, sorry, multifamily brownstones, which were, you know, had been converted into apartments, let's say in the 70s, are now being bought 10, 20 million dollars and being converted back to single family homes. So you're really, you're getting a, a density shrinkage that way too. And there's certainly, no, you know, there's no way to regulate. Nobody talks about that. Nobody says, no, you can't turn your brownstone into a single family home, but that's another yeah. issue, I think. Other questions? Yes. In historic districts, um, new building in historic districts is routinely approved by the Landmarks Commission all the time. But what developers also tell us is that the federal government has um, failed and given up in their support of affordable housing. Uh, we are in a huge debate in New York over another um, tax break for developers who put in affordable housing that wasn't passed by the, the state legislature. And there's an enormous cost of building in New York. So you can't just look at historic districts. You have to look at a much larger picture and the cost of doing business here and how um, governments have failed in this regard, too. You know, there was a really, really good report put out by the, uh, a couple years ago by the um, uh, uh, New York Construct Building Congress, I think. Really good, and talked about this. And I think that Professor Glazer would in, in, you know, agree with almost all of their recommendations, and I'd agree with 70% of them on this regulatory thing, the hurdles that the city and others put up to make building, just in general, more affordable. But what was interesting in the report, and there was land use recommendations as well. Not once was historic district you mentioned. Not once was landmarking. Here's the real estate industry saying, here's the problems, here's why it's so damn expensive. Not once was historic preservation identified as here's one of the villains in this cost thing. Look, I mean, just statistically, it is true that when you compare pre and post designation, the amount of permits in historic districts go down, right? So I have an NBR working paper that's forthcoming, maybe it's out in the Journal of Urban Economics, peer reviewed paper on, on this. So there's no, you know, I, I don't think there's any statistical debate about whether or not this reduces production in right. new space. There is a question as to whether or not, you know, that's good or bad. We can debate whether or not that's a, but don't, don't be confused and think that somehow or other this isn't having an impact on the amount of development. But I agree with this. In some sense, we're debating preservation because preservation is sort of cool and interesting and when there, where there's a sort of an active debate going on. It's a small part of the problem, right? Um, you know, I, I probably think it's a somewhat larger part because maybe I'm more focused on, on the urban core and maybe I think that 20% of the land area is a pretty big deal. But unquestionably, it, it, if you eliminate it, it will not solve the problem, right? Many other things need to be brought in as well, and there needs to be a single-minded focus on making sure that we are actually delivering more affordable housing. Now, I do worry that the attitude of the developers is that they need more subsidies from Washington. This is not a sustainable solution for anything. New York stayed affordable in the 1920s when it was producing 100,000 units a year in the early years of that, that decade, not through federal subsidies, but through the you know, untrammeled uh, development process, right? It can be done. It's not clear that we ever want to go back to that world entirely, but we need more of that world, right? We need more of a world in which we can supply more space, we can allow more people into the city. Every time we say no to a new project, we're saying no to a family that wants to experience the joys of this city. And we're saying that the families who live here have to pay more. And we consequently need to be very sure when we say no that we are actually doing it for good enough reasons. Totally agree with all of that. Yes. And I think historic preservation is one of those good enough reasons. <laughs> Back here, thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit about um, not the supply that's coming online, but the supply that already exists, specifically the rent regulation system? Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you're taking a lot of supply off the market, and you're constantly hearing stories about folks who have rent-regulated apartments, rent-stabilized, rent-controlled, who uh, are making a lot of money, and it's simply a function of tenure that they have those uh, regulated units and how that affects the overall uh, affordability picture. Don, do you want to? Do you want to? No, I mean, you're. I, I'm a conventional economist on this. I, I, <laughs> I like most economists. I, I am deeply hostile to rent control in lots of in lots of different ways. There's a great line by the um, Swedish uh, social democrat uh, Asser Lindbeck, a distinguished economist, who said, "Short of bombing, there's no way that we know of destroying a city that's more effective than <laughs> rent control." Uh, and uh, certainly, the the process of of you know moving towards reform needs to be gradual. Needs to make sure that we're we're not you know causing enormous harm by doing it but a world in which we don't have sort of a privileged class of people who get below market rent units and, and the rest of the world, that's a, that's a world that troubles me. I mean, real affordability means anyone who comes to New York can rent an apartment at a reasonable price. 
It's not that we've made a few people lucky enough that they've inherited a rent-controlled apartment or they've you know, been lotteried into something. It needs to be a world in which it's actually open and, and accessible to, to everybody. Anyone else? Yes. Uh, maintaining affordable housing and without uh, and, a, and a nonprofit basis, including Ed Koch's largest site in the Bronx, which is thriving after 30 years with a mix of incomes and a mix of ethnicities and great transportation. You can't do it without subsidies. We did not have homelessness until uh, the dramatic cutback in uh, federal subsidies combined with uh, uh, Letting, uh, not building um, residences for mentally ill when uh, the uh, institutions were destroyed. I'm simplifying it, and I'm writing a lot about this, but I have struggled uh, to build it all that cheap if you took away all the re regulations. I know that the biggest creator of wonderful manufactured housing tells me it's not a silver bullet. Mm. There, that you could tweak at it, yeah. but without the uh, Section 8 being an entitlement, uh, it's not a question. I'm sorry. No, but let me. Let me. But it's a, but it's a, it was a very good point, and let me let me take a chance to clarify. I, I don't have a problem with Section Eight housing vouchers at all. I mean, I, I have. You know, I, I think that actually having housing being a part of our you know robust of a robust anti-poverty program for this country is perfectly sensible. I tend to prefer vouchers that are person specific, not not development specific, but uh, you know, that's the economist in me. I like, I like people to be able to choose what they move around. What I'm, what I'm more hostile to is, is writing checks to, to developers to provide, provide units more generally. And, and we were talking the other day about Tribeca, which is not an aesthetically particularly beautiful neighborhood, now the most expensive neighborhood in New York City, and we agreed that the Mitchell Lama housing in Tribeca, which was a state subsidized program from the 70s, high rises, it allows middle class people to live in Tribeca still. I mean, eventually those will go to market rate and that'll be a problem, but I mean, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. That's the kind of thing. It is. The other thing, and, and, and I probably may not be quite at the same position about, you know, on, on incentives, but I think that one real missed opportunity in the city of New York is the extraordinary low number of projects in this city over the last 20 years that have combined the use of, of already existing incentives. That is the historic rehabilitation tax credit layered with the low income housing tax credit. People all over the country are doing that, making great affordable housing in great historic buildings uh, using those resources. I know that there's some technical, I mean, I come from the real estate world, so I know this you know, basis adjustment, blah, blah, blah stuff is difficult, but there's gotta be a way to overcome it. That there's great, there's tools already in place that have been used vastly in every other large city in America that have been using, used embarrassingly low amounts in a city that needs it as much as any place else in the world. Sir. Uh, <clears throat> if you could explain your hostility to subsidies for developers to create affordable housing. You know, I'm also an affordable housing developer uh, in New Jersey. And for me to purchase land, however cheap it is, and then you know, the per cost for building is pretty consistent no matter where you are. Uh, then to convince an investor to come on board and back that project is not economically sustainable across the board. You know, there will be a gap unless there's some kind of government assistance. So, could you so, that so absolutely. So let me, let me be clear on one thing. So first of all, there are a bunch of programs that are specifically targeted at poor people, like Section 8 housing vouchers. So that's a person-specific policy, and I, like many economists, favor those. And one of the reasons we like Section 8 housing vouchers is they enable people to, poor people to move to leave areas of poverty in, and we have you know, great evidence from Raj Chetty and others that shows that when they move to lower poverty areas, it makes a difference for their life, life outcomes, which is why this mobility is key. Then there's a question of are we gonna directly subsidize supply in a variety of different ways? And I actually don't have a problem with doing that in the Northeast, and I don't have a problem with doing that in California. I do have a problem with federal programs that put the whole country in that same bucket. So there's no question that we are undersupplied here, and which any nudge that we can get that gets a little more affordable housing units is actually desirable, and that's true of San Francisco as well, and it's true of Boston, right? But there are great swaths of America that are also hit by LIHTC, that you know, we've got no business subsidizing new housing production in central city of Detroit, right? More than 90% right. of the homes are valued considerably low than, less than construction costs, right? We've got no business subsidizing housing in Houston, where the private market does unbelievably well at producing low-cost housing for, for ordinary people. And I think 
the key thing also just to remember is that there's a difference between programs that are targeted to poverty and you want that with the general problem of affordable housing. So there's one problem for New York, which is the poverty problem. There's a second problem, which is middle income people can't afford to buy a house at a reasonable price and they require different solutions. And I don't want us to think that the solution for the middle income people in New York is subsidies. That's not their solution. The solution is uh, a freer system of development that enables more homes to be brought to market. All right, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. Please thank, thank our panelists and